Thanks, guys. Um, thanks, everybody, for showing up. I know it's evening time, and you might want to be home. And, um, but hopefully, we're going to make it somewhat educational, and hopefully, more than anything, make it fun. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is ACLs, right? Uh, we're going, to talk, uh, we're going to start talking about some ACL anatomy, uh, because who can, who, we can't have enough anatomy, right? And then, of course, we're going to talk about a little bit about ACL function. Uh, uh, and then we're going to talk briefly about how people, when they get injured, what does that look like? Um, and talk about treatment options, both non-operative and surgical treatment options. And perhaps the two most important slides that I'm going to talk about are how do we prevent injuries, right? Because we all know an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Uh, and then we're going to briefly talk about how we're doing ACLs today, how it's better than it was even like two years ago. Yo. Yeah, right. So that's that's the front of the knee. Um, I guess my laser pointer is almost out of battery. You can't see it. So the knee is essentially bent. So that white stuff is the is the cartilage on the end of the femur and the ACL and the PCL are crisscrossing. Okay, you're going to see this image a bunch, so I'm glad I'm glad that you got oriented. Um, <clears throat> so ACL is the ligament in the knee, right? So the, the knee is the femur or the thigh bone coming down and the tibia and the shin bone coming up. But you can see that the medial and lateral menisci are not are, are labeled, and what's not labeled is the ACL right there in the middle. Uh, and one of the things I like to do is demystify medical nomenclature, right? We always have to make simple things sound harder to justify the bill, right? So ACL stands for uh, anterior, which just means in front. Cruciate, cruci and if you've ever spent any time in a Catholic church, you know cru cruciate means cross, right? Crucifix. And then the L is ligament, and the ligament is just a soft tissue structure that connects two pieces of bone. Right, it acts like a check ring of some, of some sort of abnormal motion. So that's what ACL stands for. Uh, so what does the ACL cross in front of? It crosses in front of the ligament that crosses behind it. They're sort of like names for each other. That's the PCL. So what does the ACL do? It, uh, it's a ligament, so it, it stops abnormal bony motion. This, this is that, that, uh, that front view of the knee that you saw earlier. This one over to your right is a side view where a part of the knee is cut out and that ACL is coming front to back there. I'm sorry my laser pointer is not working. Um, <clears throat> if you look at that side view, you can clearly see that, so this is the back part of the knee, this is the front part of the knee. If something wanted to push that tibia forward, that ligament would generate tension and stop that, that anterior movement, translation of the tibia on the femur, okay? That's, that's the easiest way to think about ACL function, all right? But what it really does, more clinically relevant to athletes, if you look at it in this picture here, where the ACL is somewhat diagonal, right? It's not straight up and down, it's kind of going this way. This part of the tibia wants to rotate towards us this anterolateral rotatory instability. And that's more clinically relevant. If you have an ACL deficient knee, when you go to turn to go up a stair and your knee gives out on you, it's because it's rotating abnormally, okay? How does it happen that you tear your ACL? We're gonna show this a couple of different ways. This is a, a series of drawings showing the typical non-contact ACL injury. That's the way most ACL injuries happen. It's not when someone hits the knee or, you know, Johnny doesn't get his legs swept. It's usually when you jump and land incorrectly. So it can happen, you know, trail running, playing tennis, playing basketball. I had a teacher at a, um, at a, like a work function on their, um, uh, one of the days when the kids aren't in school. And the, the guy leading the group said, everybody jump up, say yay, and land. And she landed and she blew out her ACL, right? So it, what happens is the knee basically falls in like this. And you can see that the femur rotates in and the tibia rotates out and it tears the ACL. And I think this video perhaps shows it a little better. Femur rotates in, tibia rotates out, bloop, and you can see that the knee just kind of gives out a little bit, right? Uh, the skin goes away, it's the same view. The next one is a, a side view. The, the last one I think is the most helpful. So it, and it kind of just rotates a little bit and it kind of gives out. 
Now this back view, you're going to actually. Because, so, because is it here, the, that middle section right in there as well? Or just, is it here, is it just a. Where does it tear? Yes, exactly. Well. Does it tear other areas too as it's, as it's pressing that way? Yes, very good question. The answer is yes, it can. Okay. Uh, it, the ACL itself can tear anywhere along its course. More often than not, it comes off the femur, but sometimes it happens in the middle part of the ligament. The most common injury, associated injury, is a lateral meniscus tear because it's when your knee's falling in like this, the outside part of the knee gets pinched like that. So it often tears lateral meniscus. And similarly, because the knee pops in, you also commonly tear your MCL, the ligament on the inside part of the knee. So yes. All right. So. And then uh, this poor lady, if you ever Google search ACL, this poor lady always comes up. You know, she had the poor opportunity to tear her ACL when somebody was taking a series of pictures, right? So if you f start on the left, she's trying to post on that left knee. You can see her left knee starts to go in, and all of a sudden it caves on her. And that's exactly, she, that's the moment she tore her ACL, okay? So it's usually some sort of acute event. It's, you hear a pop, and it hurts like the dickens, right? Um, it swells immediately and it feels stiff, but this isn't a broken bone. Oftentimes you can get people up and you can start getting them walking and they actually, sometimes if they're motivated enough, they'll, they'll convince themselves that they want to go back into the game, right? Um, and you can get fooled. Now, what does it look like on physical examination? This is the number one tip off. Some young person comes in, they were, they were playing basketball, they landed, they felt something go on their leg and their knee looks like this. This is not just regular swelling. This is blood inside the knee joint. We call it an effusion, right? That soft tissue ligament has got a blood supply and when it ruptures, it bleeds and it fills up the knee. You, there's a couple of good exam maneuvers. Uh, one is the Lachman test, which is the knees and a little bit of flexion and the anterior drawer test. And basically you're seeing if that tibia can translate abnormally on the femur. Um, and it's, it's pretty easy to do unless the person's really swollen or really painful. All right. But of course, we get the MRIs to confirm the diagnosis and to look for those other injuries that you asked about. Okay. On the left here, we see a pretty good side view uh, MRI where the, the bone up the top is the femur and then the bo bone below is the tibia. And then you have the, the kneecap on the far left, right? And that gray or the black structure is the ACL. And it corresponds to our drawing that we saw earlier. Okay? Now, that is a torn ACL. Same exact view. You can see the, the ACL starting on the tibia. And it kind of looks a little wavy, right? It doesn't have the normal tension. And as you follow it up to see if you can find it like attached to the femur, it just kind of doesn't, right? So that poor individual tore their ACL. Now, how do we treat them? And there's basically two options. You can have, you can try to rehab it, right? Non-operative care. Now, this doesn't, this doesn't get the ligament to heal. This ligament does not heal back. This tries to get the knee to function well absent the ACL. Or you can have surgical reconstruction. Now, you notice I didn't say surgical repair, right? For a, a generation ago, people used to try to put sutures in the, into the two ends and then tie them together, and that doesn't fail. Or, I'm sorry, that doesn't work, that failed. Uh, Non-operative treatment, like I said, you're, you're trying to get the knee to function well without an ACL. The main way you do it, once you get them over the acute event, is you want to work on their hamstring muscles and get the hamstring muscles strong. Because basically what the hamstrings do, the hamstrings are these muscles in the back of the thigh, right? When they fire, they pull back on the tibia because without an ACL, the tibia wants to slide forward, right? So the hamstrings can act as a dynamic stabilizer of the knee. And then for high-risk activities, you're going to give them a brace. So what does the surgery look like? And basically, you're, using, you're getting a graft, a collagen source, and you want to recreate the anatomy of the ACL. So this drawing, you can see that it's got a diagonal course, right? Just like the one, uh, the images that we show you of the uninjured. Um, and you're going to rebuild the, rebuild the ACL. We were talking about this a second ago. We either autograft tissue taken from the person themselves or tissue from a cadaver. That's a whole other talk, and I'd be happy to talk more about it at the end. But the answer is there is no answer. <laughs> All right, so now 
Let me back up a second. I'm going to show you a video because it's, it's, this is a hard surgery to sort of visualize. So I'm going to show you a video uh, of a standard ACL reconstruction technique and probably the way, the way I was doing it up to about two years ago. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how we do it differently. So you start on the tibial side, you see that guide pin coming in and you can see this guide pin pop out right where you want the ACL to start on the tibia. And then over that guide pin, you're going to bring in a reamer. And that reamer is going to, going to cut a path all the way through the tibia, right? You're going to take that reamer out. You're going to advance another guide pin up into the femur. And over that guide pin, you're going to drill another a tunnel in the femur. Now, sometimes that tunnel goes all the way through. Sometimes it doesn't. But now you've got two tunnels, one in the tibia, one in the femur. You're going to pass your graft through those tunnels very slowly. According to the video, you're going to pass it very slowly. <laughs> and then once you get the graft where you want it, you have to fix it. You have to make sure it doesn't move and, and the body's going to heal it in. So uh, what was sort of the, better, the best way to do it was these interference screws. There's a little guide wire that goes up. An interference screw goes in over that guide wire, basically sandwiching the graft that you've got in the tunnel against the tunnel. And it holds it there until the body heals it in there. And then, you, and then another interference screw on the other end. And you've got your ACL reconstruction. And it's lunchtime. All right. Um, so prevention. We talked a lot about ACL tears, right? How do we stop tears from happening in the first place? And there's really good news here. There's good evidence that a good, simple prevention program actually works that you can actually do some simple things that actually might make somebody a better athlete, but you're also going to decrease the risk of having an ACL tear. And there's a couple of keys. This is a very complex discussion, preventing ACL uh, tears. And you could, I could spend an hour talking to you about all six facets of a really good prevention program. But I'm not going to, well, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> Uh, but instead, I, you know, if you want to take six keys and, and make it a useful talk, I, I boiled it down to two. So number one, learning how to jump and land, okay? And once you get those muscles working the way they're supposed to work, you got to make sure that they're strong enough and fatigue resistant enough that they're working as well in the fourth quarter as they were in the first quarter. Because fatigue plays a huge role in this. About four or five years ago, they did, a re they did a really interesting study on um, ACL tears in the NBA, looking at the timing of it. 75% of tears that happened in the NBA occurred in the fourth quarter. All right? So how do you jump, how do you land incorrectly? Right? So remember, the mechanism is when your knee goes in and your femur rotates in and your, your tibias rotate out, right? So this is the bad that you can see clearly labeled. You don't need a laser pointer, right? That's the wrong way to land. And some people land like this just naturally. You know, you, you, at, at like a pre-participation physical, you have kids jump and have them land. And you can, in two seconds, you can identify those people that are at greater risk and those that aren't. And you can simply have a 30 second uh, conversation with them about correct landing. And if the 16 year old in front of you is listening, they've actually shown that simple intervention to be relatively effective. With 30 seconds of just talking to a kid, you can actually save a couple ACL tears, okay? But this involves, that good landing involves a, a somewhat different muscle pattern firing and different uh, muscle recruitment. So then you've got to support it uh, uh, with a strength and endurance program, right? So this, this is a sort of a four-stage program broken out invo involving a, a warm-up, plyometrics and jump training. This is more uh, the, the how to jump correctly. And then a high intensity strength training, uh, getting better strength and endurance. And then a, then a flexibility part. And if anybody wants, I can send this to you. This is that four step program broken out in actual, actually useful detail. All right, so that's prevention. Now, how are we doing it better than that video that I just showed you? Um, and, the, and the best, the biggest advance that we made is where we're putting the femoral tunnel. 
So again, we've seen this image a bunch, right? That ACL's got that diagonal course, and that diagonal course is important for controlling that rotatory instability, and that's the one that athletes get into trouble with if we don't correct well. This one, this picture of an ACL reconstruction, that's the old way, and that one's the new way. And it's just subtly different. If you, if you look at that, what we call the notch, okay? That is the top half of a clock face, where the, where the apex of the notch is 12 o'clock. The old way, the graft is entering the bone at, say, 11 o'clock. In the new way, the, the, the graft is entering the bone at, say, 10, 9.30. It's just a little bit further down on that clock face, so it's got a little bit more of a diagonal course. Now, what was, what was making us do this? And the, and the fact is that with the old way is we drill the tunnel, the femoral tunnel, through the tibial tunnel, right? You put the guide wire up through one tunnel to get to the other one. So the position of the tibia made us determine the position of the femur. So what we had to do is figure out a way to uncouple the femoral tunnel creation from the tibial tunnel. And there's two ways to do it. One is to make a, a little tiny skin incision called the medial portal and you can put it in basically from this side of the knee. And that's one way and it works really well, but it's not the way I like to do it. I like to do it this way. And you can make an incision out here and use this relatively cool thing called a retrograde flip cutter. Both ways are great because you can put the femoral tunnel wherever the heck you want it. And you can nail it. And then you don't have to cheat on the tibial side, so you can put the tibia right where it's supposed to go. All right? And we're talking millimeters, but if if we could just make that rotatory instability better, then we've done a better ACL. Now, in fixation strategies, right? the old way was the interference screws, uh, where you put that screw in there and sand sandwich the graft against the tunnel. It worked great, but maybe these, these suspensory devices are a little bit better with these little metal buttons on the bottom. right? So the interference screws, standard method, pushes the graft against the tunnel you needed a really long tunnel to do it. The problem is when you, when you make your tunnels more diagonal, you got a shorter tunnel. So we started running out of real estate. So we had to think about, we had to rethink our fixation methods and the suspensory device is a nice, is a nice solution. And there were actually, there were suspensory devices 20 years ago. And the people that thought they were better than the, than the interference screws liked the fact that you had the entire graft healing into the tunnel. So then, well, then so we were sort of forced back into the suspensory devices and say, well, you know, maybe they are better. You know, it's kind of interesting how our thoughts can change. And you can use the shorter tunnels. So now, I'm going to show you a video of the way I do it currently, and I think the uh, way most people are sort of going towards. Um, so you're going to, instead of starting on the tibial side, you start on the femoral side. I like using this over the top thing, but you can come in for the medial side as well. So there's this little, uh, you, this guide wire comes in, and it makes a short little tunnel, right? It makes a little tiny hole the entire length of the femur. We're going to see this uh, sleeve go down against the bone. Now the really cool thing, and hopefully it zooms in and you can see it, the very end, you flip it, and now it becomes a reamer and you spin it, and instead of making a tunnel the entire length of the femur, you just make a, t a short tunnel, leaving the rest of the bone intact. And then you flip that back and you pull it out. You pass a suture down. I think if you were a magician as a young kid, you'd be a good sports surgeon, right? So then, and then for the sake of time, I cut out the video where you make the tibial tunnel, but you make the same kind of a thing. You make a, a partial tibial tunnel, you grab another suture, and you're going to use these sutures to pull the graft through. And you, if you watch, the, there's a metal button on the end of that. It goes through that small tunnel. It flips, and now it sits on the end of the bone, and it's stably fixed. And you can sort of drag the graft into the tunnel, and then you're going to magically get the other uh, part of the graft in the tunnel, and you can play with it. You can move the knee back and forth, you can cycle it, and you can continue to, to fine-tune your tension. And then when you like it, you just basically tie a knot, and it's nice and stable. And you can do it, I mean, uh, skin incisions aren't the biggest thing in the world, but you can do it through tiny little skin incisions instead of the bigger ones that we used to use. But the more important thing is we get the graft going in the right direction, and we're getting better fixation 
without stuff in the, in the tunnel. So what do we do? We talked about the ACL anatomy, its function, how people present to the office when they've torn their ACL, the treatment options, how to prevent them, right? We want to work on correct landing and we want to do basically plyometrics and strength training so that we can land as well in the first quarter as, as we were landed, or in the fourth quarter as we were landed in the first quarter. Uh, and then uh, how we do a better job of reconstructing these things. What kind of, hopefully we have some questions.